before I start, uh, raise your hand if you already use Ember. Okay, so like most people here aren't already using Ember, so in fact, the title of my talk is, is relevant. Um, so I actually find myself when I give talks about Ember sort of going back and forth between um, giving a talk that's like a demo of Ember, which is not what I'm doing today, and doing something that I find sad I have to do at all, which is to be sometimes the, well, feels like the lonely job of being the defender of abstractions in front-end JavaScript. Um, and I say that, and it's easy to laugh at that and say, of course, everyone agrees abstractions are a good idea. We should have shared solutions, et cetera. But for some reason, in, it's especially the case in front-end JavaScript, um, but it's just a flashy idea in general, the idea that abstractions are the thing that has, have gotten us down. Abstractions are the reason why everything sucks. Abstractions are the reason why you struggle. Really what you should do is every application should build everything from scratch. And I find myself often defending the position that that is not really correct. And today I'm going to sort of do that at a higher level. I'm going to talk about uh, what things like Ember do for you across a whole variety of different um, situations. So the first thing is that in order to understand writing software in general and your own experiences. So I've been writing software now for 10 years. For the first like three years, I said, surprisingly, I have only been writing software for three years. Now I've been writing for 10 years. I can't say that anymore. Um, but I've been writing software for 10 years. There are people who have been writing software a lot longer than that. Um, and probably the biggest breakthrough that I've personally had about software writing is to understand the concept of cognitive depletion. And that's the idea that um, you have a certain amount of cognitive resources, your brain has a certain amount of power in it basically, and a bunch of different things depleted. And this, this is very good science around this. Um, and the things that depleted are, are uh, things that don't seem very connected. Things like um, solving, uh, making trivial decisions, or having an argument. Those two things actually draw from the same pool. So if you uh, have an argument with your wife in the morning and then go to work and have to make a trivial decision, it turns out that the set of resources that you have to use to make the trivial decision are already depleted. It doesn't seem connected, but, but it is. Um, and the, really the hard thing about writing software is that um, because a lot of software is written when we are in a cognitively depleted state, you know, you write one-fifth of all your software on Friday and one-fifth of all your software after 2 or 3 p.m., right? Uh, a lot of your software is written in a cognitively depleted state. We really can't get away with requiring ourselves to be perfect all the time. So really the argument against abstractions a lot of times is that, well, if we just decide what is the right way to write software, if we tell everyone what the right way is, we'll give people a style guide or a patterns book, then we can just make sure that all the developers on your team and you when you're tired always do the right thing. But in practice, you cannot do that. In practice, nobody's perfect, and even if you think you're personally perfect and you could do the right thing every minute of every day, what about the rest of your team? Um, so I like to say sloppy code is basically just physics of software development. You can't legislate it away. You can't make it disappear by simply trying to say by fiat, nobody on my team is allowed to write sloppy code. It's just how it is. So what do we do? How do we deal with the fact that sloppy code is a, is a law of physics? So it turns out that we've been struggling with this from the beginning, from literally the very beginning. Um, and the answer for how we deal with sloppy code is some kind of isolation mechanism. So in the very, very beginning, the first software that was ever written was basically a series of machine instructions, all of which were written flat, right? So a big program, it's just a bunch of machine instructions. If you want to do something in a loop, no problem. Just jump back to where it started from, uh, use some instructions that let you jump away, et cetera. Um, but over time, what happened is people said, well, if I do that, then every line of code has to know about every other line of code. That's very annoying. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create the concept of a function. Function is a piece of code that you can be a little sloppy inside of because you know that the sloppiness inside of it doesn't leak out. So the, things like the concept of lexical scope are really big improvements to software development purely because of the fact that they let you be a little bit sloppy inside of an area of code without messing with everything else. So really the hard, the, the thing that helps us write software in a scalable way, and I don't mean you know, scalable across machines, I just mean you can write a lot of software and have it run in a single program. How do you write Photoshop? The way that we do that is by breaking things up into pieces that we know can't really mess with each other. So a good example of this in the domain that we're in this room for is uh, in basically every web framework, components own a DOM element, right? Now, in the DOM is a big blob of shared mutable state, just like uh, your system resources on an, in an operating system is a big blob of shared mutable state, right? When you read from a socket, the socket is a virtual thing. In reality, there's something real that everybody is sharing. <coughs> Um, but in the web framework, uh, the framework or the library is responsible for slicing up 
the big blob of shared mutable state, which is the entire DOM, and giving each component just one element to write on. So this is how it works in Ember. You uh, subclass from Ember components um, using ES6 syntax here. So in today's Ember world, basically everything uses ES6. So we ship Babel by default, et cetera. Um, anyway, so here we have a, a subclass of Ember.component, and the did insert element hook basically gets called, and inside of it you have access to this dot dollar or this dot element, and both of those things are restricted to just the element that you're supposed to be writing on. And actually in this case, what's interesting is that um, there's nothing stopping you from saying dot parent, or like going into one of your child components. You can absolutely do that, and that is absolutely a thing that you can mess up with. But even just adding a little bit of friction that tells you the right thing to do here is to work with your element, not somebody else's element helps a lot. It helps, it helps people write soft components that are isolated from each other without the problem of, you know, all of a sudden every, every component has to worry about every other component. And for me, the biggest question that I ask to know if Ember is successful, when I go into a big project, so a few uh, weeks ago I went to Intercom, which has a pretty big uh, Ember app, and I looked up at their code base. I basically did a full audit of their code base. And one of the questions that I ask myself is not um, for a particular screen or a particular component, is this component good, is it well written, um, is it fast? Those are all good questions, but those are pretty generic. The question I ask myself in Ember is, does, this comp does the component here mess with this component over here? Does this screen over here mess with this screen over there? And generally speaking, the, the set of abstractions that we give you in Ember mean that no matter how messy a particular screen or a particular component got, the answer is almost always it does not mess with another screen or another component. Um, and, I, and that's a source of pride for me. Um, so fundamentally, uh, what this example shows is that frameworks help you resolve this a core tension between a desire for isolation, desire to have little pieces that you can, get, you know, if you give an intern, please write this component and know that they're not messing with the rest of the world, and the fact that applications, all applications across all domains, are fundamentally operating on a blob of mutable state. The reason why this is true is because there is always something in the real world you are trying to do. Right? If your application had nothing to do with the real world, it would be a very boring application. It would run in an ivory tower somewhere, but it wouldn't matter. Um, at minimum, time is a thing that exists in all programs. Right? So there's always some kind of shared mutable state that exists that you are operating against. And there's a tension between the fact that that is a real thing that exists in the real world and the fact that in order to get a good, do a good job with uh, programming and, and having a team and having bad days, you really need some kind of isolation. And probably a really good analogy to this is memory, and I'm going to have a bunch of analogies here, is memory in an operating system, right? So the very first uh, operating systems didn't do anything special with memory. There was just, I'm going to, so there's 640K, although there were periods of time when it was less, but there was a long time where 640K was the amount of memory that existed. And you just, that was the amount of memory you had, and every application just dealt with the same 640K. And if you were like, I have a game and it needs all the 640K, you would just like put in a floppy disk and it would boot up and then it would be the operating system and it would have all the 640K, right? Um, and the, the thing, once we got out of having only 640K, which is a very small amount of memory in today's terms, it's a very lot of amount of memory at that time, but today's terms is a very small amount, is we said, instead of having every application work with the same big 640, the same blob of memory, we're gonna give each application, each process, a slice of memory that it could pretend is the, all the memory in the world. Right? So when you're in the process, and you've probably experienced this at some point, you don't have to worry about where the memory is. You don't have to care. Maybe it's swapped onto disk. You don't have to care about that. Right? You just pretend you have a slice, a blob of memory. You ask the allocator for some memory. Give me a megabyte. You get it. You work with it. It starts from zero. It ends at a megabyte. Right? And that, that is solving a similar kind of problem, where we would like to be able to let people write processes that don't mess with each other. We don't want my little program to mess with Chrome, because that would be very bad, since the Chrome developers are much better than me. Um, but we do need, uh, so, we, so we, don't, we need isolation, but we also, in reality, are working on a real blob of memory that exists in the real world, right? So now one of the things that's interesting is, so you could just say, imagine you're writing an uh, uh, operating system. You could just say, every time someone asks for memory, I'm just going to slice the next megabyte and give it to them. But the problem is, if you do it like this, what's going to happen is there's a hypothetical optimizations that you can do. You could, for example, notice that an application isn't running anymore. It hasn't, asked, it hasn't done anything in a while. You could hypothetically take that memory and give it to somebody else. But in order to do that, you really, um, there's sort of this tension because the application, the one that asked for the memory that isn't around anymore, doesn't really know that it's part of this big world, right? So you can't give any individual application responsibility for these kinds of optimizations. 
because the whole point of the solution that we just described is that they don't know that they're part of a big world, right? So the whole idea behind isolation is you think you're the whole world. But in reality, you're not the whole world. And if you try to just slice things up and give people little chunks, um, what ends up happening is that you end up with duplicated work. You end up with global optimizations that you could, in theory, do that you can't do anymore. And so what's kind of interesting is that this is a real tension that exists in pretty much all domains. And one of the first things that happens is that people say, the problem is abstraction. The problem is abstraction. The problem is you're making me work against a system that is giving me a little blob of memory. If you just let me control the whole universe, then I could do a better job than your stupid kernel. And so this is the idea behind like the exo kernels, is I can do a better job than your stupid kernel if you just gave me all the power. And I sort of, I think that this is sort of missing the point. And I'll, uh, to illustrate it, I want to use a different example, which is sockets in an operating system. Uh, so I already sort of talked about the fact that there's a global optimization with memory where you can start reusing things that aren't heavily in use. Sockets are another example of this, which is if you want to open a socket and read from it, of course, from a naive perspective, you can open the socket, connect to another server, read some data. You can read the data whenever you want. You can read it into your buffer, whatever. It's great. But in reality, in, on any given system, there's usually many, many, many open sockets or files at a given time reading at a whole bunch of in a whole bunch of different ways. And the right way to do that across the entire system is to have a shared buffer that's global. Right? So you have one global shared buffer, and somebody somewhere says, oh, I see that all these 50 processes have asked for data. Instead of having 50 open buffers for all 50 uh, requests, I'll wait until I have some data, I'll read it into my shared buffer, and then I'll give it to the user when they ask for it. Um, and the problem is that, so this is an optimization that pretty much all modern operating systems based on Unix do. But it's an optimization that you fundamentally cannot do in a process, because the process does not know about the other processes. So there's really no way for my process and your process to say, I know that we're both waiting for some memory. I know that we're both waiting for some, uh, for some data from the, from the server, from another server. Just share a single buffer, because we're not allowed to know about each other's buffers. We're not allowed to know about each other's memory. We're not allowed to know about each other's sockets. And this is fundamentally just a conflict between the fact that it is very important that I cannot know about your process, that we are not allowed to know about each other. That's how the security system works. That's how just not, not only security, but just having programs that actually work and can scale. And I could download a program off the internet and run it on my computer and not have it crash my web browser. Right? That is fundamentally the process isolation model is important. But also fundamentally, we're working on real things that exist in the real world. And we need to find some way of doing a global optimization. Um, another example is method calls in a programming language. And I'll eventually get back to how this all ties together to web frameworks. But in a programming language, if you have a function that calls a function that calls a function that calls a function, it's very important that each of those functions doesn't know that they're actually running inside of a particular context. right? So when you write a function, it's very important that it be allowed to run from anywhere. Anybody can call it. But in reality, it's only actually being called from a small number of places. And in reality, there's a global optimization that you could perform, which is called inlining. And that's a gatekeeper optimization for a whole bunch of other optimizations that you would like to be able to perform. But you could only perform it when you know the whole picture. right? So on the one hand, it's very important that when I write a function, I can't assume anything about who's calling me. On the other hand, in order to get optimal performance, the thing that's actually running the code has to be able to know the whole story. And then to, and to get back to the web, there's sort of the same story here. There's a single DOM. There's a single network layer. And we would like to be able to, I would like to be able to manipulate my DOM without messing with your DOM. I would like to be able to install an add-on into my Ember app and have it work with a little chunk of DOM and not have it mess with the entire system. Like I said, that's a source of pride to me that that works. But on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, people touching a lot of DOM. And there's probably some optimizations that we can do to make it work better. And I'll get to that in a second. And, and similarly with the network. If you're talking to the same server and you could batch things into one request, you would like to be able to do that. But everybody making a network request is not, is not supposed to know about everybody else making a network request. Because if you do that, it becomes hard to actually write programs that are any size. Right? So that, all that was just sort of to say there is a fundamental tension in software. It's not just about Ember or operating systems or programming languages. It's a fundamental tension between the fact that in order to write software that is any size, you have to write software in isolated chunks. And, but the fact that those isolated chunks are fundamentally not supposed to know about each other makes it very hard to do the kinds of global optimizations you need to do to make things fast. So how, do, what, how does this fit into Ember? So it turns out that in, in, on web frameworks, there is basically one trick 
that is how you do an optimization. And you should do this if you were writing everything without isolation from scratch. Let me give you an example. So here's an Ember component, and all that it does is whenever you click on the Ember component, it increments its, its counter property. So there's a counter property, it starts at zero, every time you click, it increments it. And then you have a, component, a template that says, show me the value of the counter. So what happens when I render? When I render uh, the first time, what happens is I you know, create a div, and I create zero, and I close the div and put it into the DOM. But now what happens when you click on the div? What happens is it calls this click handler. The click handler sets counter. What that does in Ember and in, in other frameworks that do this optimization is it says, instead of saying, um, OK, I will immediately go. So very naive frameworks, what they do is they immediately go, sorry, they immediately go and just update that little red circle. But what less naive frameworks do, the ones that are doing the one weird trick, is they just remember that that node has to be, that it is dirty. They remember that that is a thing that has to be updated later. Now imagine that somewhere else in the tree, during the same pick, in response to the same click handler, I modify some other node, some node up there. Uh, that also doesn't update the node right away. It instead just remembers that there's something to do. And later on, what happens is we just walk the tree. We say, OK, here on the top node, is this dirty? No, it's not dirty. OK, nothing to do. What about this node? Nope, nothing to do. Ah, this node is dirty, so let's update it. Great. This node is dirty, let's update it. Awesome. What about this node? No, not dirty, nothing to do, great. Now, that might not seem so important in this example, because in this example, those two nodes were disconnected from each other. So in this case, it wouldn't have mattered if we did it at, at the moment when the thing happened or later. But what's very, very common is that what happens is that the top, the, one of the parent nodes actually goes away, gets destroyed, right? So what happens is instead of just random nodes getting changed that you could just fire and render whatever you want, what happens is, in your tree, some nodes get destroyed and other nodes get updated. So imagine that you have like a conditional that says, if the name exists, render the name. You change the name, right? What's going to happen is, if you just do it in any order, what might happen is you update the name, but then a second later you delete the entire DOM. What you would like to be able to do is delete the DOM and then notice that you don't even have to care about the child anymore. And so there's an, a global, that's just a very small example, but it happens in spades in, in the real world, is that, and you've probably noticed if you've ever written a backbone app, that what starts to happen over time is like, you're like, why is my render method getting called so many times in one tick? I would like to have it happen less. And it's like, oh, no problem. You can use debounce, but now your debounce is perhaps conflicting with someone else's debounce and it becomes very hard to manage, right? So really the trick, the one weird trick here is that when you say, I would like to update this DOM node, it doesn't actually update the DOM node. It just remembers that the DOM node has to be updated. And then later on, there's a global thing, the framework, that is responsible for doing the optimal solution. And actually, that's what this is about. How many people have seen this website, CSS Triggers? Okay. Go check it out. So what this website is basically saying is which things, uh, when you change them, so for example, if you change align content, the CSS property, it forces the browser to flush. So the browser internally has a, same, a similar version of this, which is that when you go and you change the CSS property, or you change the DOM, most of the time it doesn't do anything at all. It just remembers that there's something to do later. And then later on, like after your JavaScript code is done running, it basically relays out the whole page. And what that lets you do is it lets you make a lot of DOM manipulations, and then it will do something smart at the end. So effectively, the browser is doing the same one weird trick. However, there, the browser had made a mistake like 20 years ago, and certain properties, if you ask, like, what is the value of my offset left? It has to give you the answer right now. So what that means is that there's a certain properties, and there's a big list on this website, that if you try to update them or look them up, it forces the flushing to happen right now. So you don't want to call those things because they defeat the trick. Um, Ember doesn't have any such things. You cannot force us to relay out. You just, you just get a stale value to try to get the, the old value. But the key point here is that in UI programming, this is unrelated to Ember or React or Angular or Backbone or the browser or Coco, the main trick that you have for making things performant is when you think that you want to update something, don't actually update it. Just remember that something needs to be updated and then have a global thing that is not your component that does the updating. Now what are the benefits of the optimization? So first of all, you can guarantee for any given render that the render only happens once per user interaction. So if the user clicks on something, you can guarantee that every one of those nodes only renders at most one time. Um, like I said before, if something above you is removed, 
you're going to automatically tear down everything below it and skip it because the framework is actually rendering from top down. It's not rendering in whatever order things happen to happen in. Um, and also, you can make a lot of assumptions about the state of the world in your lifecycle hooks, right? So your lifecycle hooks, know, you know, are running at a very precise time that the framework has told you. And really, the, the point of this is just to say you really want your components to be isolated from each other. But when you do that, if you do that in the most naive way possible, you end up with performance problems. So you really need something coordinating you. You need some kind of global coordina coordination. Um, also in Ember, there's a bunch of other things that work kind of the same way. So um, boot and initialization are, uh, are not something that you do by telling us to boot. You tell us what to do when boot happens. And what this means is that add-ons can do the same thing. So every add-on can say, here's what should happen during the initialization process. And what that means is that when you install an add-on, you don't have to worry about fighting with your add-on for it's trying to do something, I'm trying to do something, it's registering doc ready handlers, I'm registering doc ready handlers, what's happening? Right? Basically, there's a predictable way that the initialization process happens. Um, similarly with navigation, when you click on a link, so when you click on a link in a regular server-side rendered app, it's, everything works totally fine because you tear down the entire page, you like free the memory and start over. But in a client-side rendered app, you haven't freed the memory, so there needs to be some way to predictably tear down what you set up. Um, and that's actually what the Ember routing system is for. The Ember routing system says uh, every route represents a page, and un again, unlike on the server, if you set some state up when you enter a page, you need to tear it down when you leave, and there's a very predictable way to do that. Um, similarly with data, right? There's, uh, a, a, when you ask for data, if you already asked for the same data before, you get the same data back. If I ask for 15 um, IDs from 15 different components, that gets coalesced into a single request on the server automatically, right? And these are all things that um, they're dealing with the tension between the fact that you would like components to not know that they're part of a world and the fact that in the real world you're making network requests and you're manipulating the DOM, right? So you need to have some global story that help, that takes these isolated components and gives you an optimal solution without making the components know about each other. And really what this means, and it's true about all these analogies, is that you have to give up control to somebody else. And people don't like giving up control. They like to think that if they have control, they can do a better job. But the thing is that that's actually just not true. Because even though you might be able to do a better job in your isolated world, you can never do a better global job. Because the whole point of the programming model, and this is not something that is special to Ember. For example, in Backbone, which has the opposite programming model, you still have isolated components that are not supposed to know about each other. Right? So the, it is actually fundamental to making the programming model scale that components and processes and iframes and all, you know, all these analogies to the same story, it is fundamental that they don't know about each other and they're not supposed to know about each other. So at the, at the end of the day, if you want that benefit, which it allows you to write bigger programs, you need to give up some control. It's fundamental to avoiding duplicated work between components that don't know each, about each other. Um, Programming languages use JITs, right? So what a JIT does is a JIT says, okay, I see that you have all these separate functions, but at runtime I'm gonna figure out, or maybe an AOT compiler, I'm gonna figure out how these things actually connect and I'm gonna do a global optimization that you, the writer of the function, wasn't allowed to do. Because you're not allowed to know who calls you. It's actually important to the function programming model. Um, similarly, uh, in OSs, it's important to the isolated process model, uh, process isolation model, that the processes not know about each other, but the kernel is allowed to. And frameworks are sort of the same story. They globally manage side effects, but they relieve you from having to worry about that, those global concerns in each component. And so the idea, the, the fundamental story here is that kernels are about dealing with shared mutable state, the real world. They're about dealing with the real world, which is why we write programs. I, I think sometimes people forget this when they get into very purist state of mind. They forget that in the real world, like, hi, I'm a human, I have a body, I have shared mutable state, time is going on. Right? We cannot describe things that people care about in the real world purely. But we would like our programs as much as possible to not have to worry about the global shared mutable state. And so what happens is the kernel is managing shared mutable state. In fact, the kernel is allowed to do things like, uh, you asked me to read from a socket. It's allowed to put the universe into an inconsistent state. As long as it makes sure that by the time it actually talks to your process, the universe is back in a consistent state. That also lets you do a lot of optimizations that you would not be able to, allowed to do inside of an individual process. And the way I like to describe this idea, and it's sort of the different from the very purist mindset, is that what, the way I like to write programs is I, li I, li I like to be allowed to write sloppy in the small and rigorous in the large. Um, what I mean by that is that it, once you have isolated boundaries, you have function boundaries and module boundaries and process boundaries, 
um, and machine boundaries when you're talking about distributed computing, it lets you be a little more sloppy in the smallest pieces, right? So the smaller you get, the more sloppy you can get. It doesn't really matter that much if your function has spaghetti code in it because the function has a very clear boundary between somebody else. So it might be a 20 line monster, but as long as it is only working with its own internal state and it works with inputs and return values, it doesn't really matter how sloppy that is. And some people like, they're, they're very, um, they really want every line of code they ever write to be pure. But like I said before, in, I don't mean, in this case, I don't mean pure in the functional way. I just mean they like it to be very nice. They like it to be nice. They like it to be rigorous. But in reality, we have to be honest about the fact that we write code when we're cognitively depleted. So mo a lot of the time, we're going to be sloppy. And the story is that we should not be in charge. So your job is to write the small code. You should not be in charge of making the isolation boundary. So that's another mistake that people make. They say, well, I agree with this idea. But basically, you cannot define the isolation boundary for me. I should make my own. Um, but we can see in other situations, like with processes, you would not want every application, every process, to be allowed to define its process isolation boundary. That wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? Because then any process that made a mistake could mess with every other process. Could accidentally imagine a process is allowed to just look at the underlying kernel buffer if it feels like. And the answer is you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to. I will give you a pattern book, and the pattern book tells you not to do that. What's going to happen is someone's going to be on a deadline, or you're going to hire an intern, and they're going to forget to do that pattern. And then all of a sudden, literally every other process in the entire system is going to crash. Right? So we can't really say it's everybody's job. I'm a good programmer. I can make the isolation boundaries. Isolation boundaries are exactly the place where frameworks and operating systems do the job. It's, it's where they decide what to do. Now, interestingly, this feeds into a really big difference in versioning between frameworks and languages and libraries. So libraries actually can, make, can basically make a version one and then if the version one isn't good, they could just, you could just make another library, right? So you can, you can make an XML processing library, and if the XML processing library turned out to have the wrong abstraction, no problem, just make another XML processing library. Uh, like in Ruby, libxml2, the pro, uh, rexml wasn't very good, so uh, libxml2 came out. libxml2 wasn't very good, nokogiri came out. And that doesn't have that much cost. But frameworks, and, and the reason for that is that you, frame, they're not really providing any kind of isolation, they're just giving you utility. So if you want to, process your XML in a different way, it's no big deal. But programming languages actually do provide you with isolation primitives, which means that switching from one framework to another, or one language to another, or one OS to another is actually a big project. Because you, uh, the framework is the thing that gave you the isolation boundaries to begin with, which is what allowed you to build the big program. And, th and then if you want to switch to something else, you need to learn the isolation story from the other thing. So if you want to switch from Unix to Windows, it's not hard because Win32 is a different API than the Linux API. It's different because the process model is different. That's what makes it hard. Um, the I.O. model is actually fundamentally different. It's hard. Um, so when I say version 2, what I mean is not the second version, the second numbered version that a programming language or language ever makes. I mean the first time that you take the thing, the first version one is always sort of sloppy. Ruby, the first version of Ruby was an AST walking interpreter. Um, the first version of Ember was a string based templating engine. Um, I, you can observe that all these things also have the same one and two property. Um, so what version two really is, is a fundamental shift in the, how the internals of your library or framework work. So you have, this, you have a framework, internally it works one way, all of a sudden you want it to work a completely different way. And it's usually based on a shift in the landscape, which is basically what's happening right now with the, with the web framework world, or it could be based on the maturing of the core team. So in, the, in Ruby's case, uh, the, it was easy for Max to write an AST walking interpreter, but then eventually the core team got more mature and they said that's not really the right way to do this, we would prefer to make a different VM. And the interesting question that you ask is when, some, when you arrive at the decision to make a V2, and everyone does arrive at it, right? If you look at this thing, you'll, it's basically everybody arrives at it at some point. The question is what do you do? Do you say, well, the internals are completely different, so obviously compatibility is impossible. We should just give up on compatibility and tell everyone that's going to be a hard transition. And you can see that some people did that. Um, or you can say, we're going to try really hard. It's not going to be perfect because the internals are different, so it's going to be hard. But we're going to try really hard to make things compatible. And the interesting thing is that people that were more in the first place um, attracted to what, not how. I'm going to, I'm going to write abstractions that teach you, that ha let you say what you're trying to do, not how you're trying to do it. 
those APIs are much more resilient to changes in the internals, right? Because the internals were just an implementation detail. The more the first version of something was telling you, I, here I'm going to directly manipulate the shared mutable state, the more that was your original API, the harder the transition ends up being. So for example, Python has this API which is sys.getframe, which is like give me a frame for the current, like on the current stack, which if you like know how to implement a programming language, it's like an insane thing to provide. However, it's a very easy mistake to make because when you write an interpreter, you have it lying around. So you may as well. Um, the problem is that if you make APIs based on I happen to have this lying around in my implementation, what's going to happen is when you decide to change your implementation, your APIs are going to change. So um, Linux and I think Ember and Ruby did a pretty good job of not exposing too many details of the internals. For example, the Ruby garbage collector API is, very, is just a conservative garbage collector. It doesn't really expo uh, leak into the C API at all. So in C, you just write normal C code and it happens to work. In Python, all the C code has to do stuff with uh, reference counting. And what that means is that if you want to change the garbage collector implementation in Python, it breaks a lot of C APIs, a lot of C code. And that is not true about Ruby. So it was easy for Ruby to upgrade to a better garbage collector implementation. It's now like a generational incremental blah, 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 sort of top of the line garbage collector because of the fact that Ruby decided from the beginning that a constraint was we're not going to leak this implementation detail into the code you have to write. Um, so that actually ends up being important. It ends up being important to try to write your V1 in a way that is mostly about what, not how. Um, unfortunately, if you make your V1 about what, not how, it tends to be slower. So for, you can look at Java, for example. The first version of Java was pretty slow. It was a bytecode interpreter. It was not the optimal implementation, and it was pretty slow. But the idea of, the, of Java was we're going to eventually be fast. So we're giving you a higher level way of describing what you're doing, which is Java bytecode, and we'll eventually figure out how to make it fast. But there's always a period of time in the beginning, in V1, where it feels like I could just do better myself. It's obvious that I could do better myself. And something that I've learned now after years of doing this and making the same mistake over and over again, basically the Java V1 mistake, is that really when you make the V1 of your thing, you really need to expose pretty good escape valves. So in Ember we have things like did insert elements, which are pretty good escape valves, but you have to be pretty willing to have a lot of different escape valves um, so that people who feel like, oh, I can't really get the job done. I'm trying, to do, I'm trying to do something, but the framework is not giving me enough tools. You give people um, ways of getting around it. Now, the thing that's important about these escape valves is that you really need to give them escape valves that don't break the isolation model, right? So you don't really want to give people an escape valve that's like, just touch whatever DOM node you want. Because if they do that, then that escape valve is going to, not going to be very forwards compatible. It's like the sys.underscore get frame problem. Right, so uh, an example in operating systems is direct mode. Right, so uh, in early versions of the of operating of Linux, um, there was always a way to say like, give me some bytes from the disk. But the first versions of Linux were pretty bad at that. If you wanted to build like Photoshop or a database, so you'd be like, give me some bytes from a disk, and it would be slow. So Linux had this thing called direct mode, where you're like, just let me control it directly. Just give me the exact. Don't try to do any smart caching. Just give me exactly what I want. And that's a good thing to do in like Linux v1, because Linux v1 is tell, has a way of explaining what you're trying to do, but it's slow. But it's important to recognize that in all systems that are built with this in mind, which is a small handful of systems, but it's some set of systems, um, what's going to eventually happen is that the kernel is going to get smarter at saying, okay, you're reading 20 bytes, this other process of reading, so the first version, I'm reading 20 bytes, you're reading 20 bytes, the kernel's not very smart at all, it just doesn't do anything good. But eventually what happens is, I'm reading 20 bytes, you're reading 20 bytes, you're reading 20 bytes, uh, let's imagine we have a disk with an arm on it. The kernel is eventually like, oh, I see that I can, I can send the arm to the right place on the spinning disk to do the right thing for the global optimization. If I had the ability to control the arm directly, perhaps if the entire operating system was just Photoshop, I could do a better job than the operating system. But when the Photoshop is running alongside Chrome, that's probably not going to be the right answer. Unfortunately, in V1 of any of these systems, it ends up being, you, don't, you get the worst of both worlds in V1. Right? You get uh, the slow abstraction and the non-global optimization. But over time, the fact that most people are writing to the slow abstraction means you get the global optimization. So you know, monkey patching in dynamic languages, direct mode for disk operating systems, uh, for disks and operating systems, did insert element in Ember, um, build.rs and cargo, which is the Rust uh, package manager. These are all escape valves that let you do things that are not already supported by the abstraction. But you really kind of have to have the knowledge that what you're doing is going to eventually be slower than the thing that is able to do the global optimization. The thing that's really great about escape valves is that they give you a corpus of real world usage, right? So if you, Ember was just, had no escape valves, 
some people would be able to use Ember, but everyone else wouldn't, and they would just go use something else, and we wouldn't actually know what the missing pieces were, right? Or direct mode in, in Linux, right? The, Linux could look at direct mode and see why are people using direct mode? What is the reason they're doing it? Ah, we can see that they're doing this or that, therefore if we make our optimizations target those use cases, we can do a good job for the guy using direct mode and also not screw the guy not using direct mode, right? So having escape valves is a pretty nice way of figuring out what's happening in the real world, and then when it comes time to do V2, which always happens, you have a big corpus of things that people have done that you can fold into the global optimization. So when it comes time to do the global optimization, you can do it with a lot more knowledge. The thing about V1, and this is unfortunate because if you look at the V1 of something like Ember versus the V1 of something like Backbone, at the time that they're both V1, they look very similar to each other, right? But really, the difference between Ember's V1 and Backbone's V1 is that Backbone saw V1 as the end. We're gonna ship some abstractions, and we trust you as the user to do the right thing. This was actually the rhetoric, right? You could do a better job than me. You as a user could do a better job. NPM does a similar thing now, NPM 3, with peer dependencies. You, application author, can do a better job resolving peer dependencies than us NPM. I don't buy that either. But um, the idea is that V1 in systems like Ember and Linux are intention and Java are intentionally kind of sloppy. They mostly focus on giving users good tools for expressing what they want to happen from the perspective of sort of hypothetically what kind of duplicated work could we avoid. So you say, okay, I'm gonna give you an API that lets you read from a socket and the idea is I can imagine some optimizations if a lot of people are using that API that I can do. Um, in the view layer, the templates, templates in Ember give you a high level understanding of the DOM and in principle there are optimizations that we could do. But Ember 1.0 didn't do a lot of that, actually. Um, similar principles apply in the Ember routing layer, the Ember model layer, et cetera. But crucially, V1 systems that are intentionally trying to go down this path are usually somewhat painful. Ruby 1 was very slow because it was, it was uh, the implementation wasn't very good, even though it had a very a high level story, right? Um, Ember v1 was also pretty slow. Didn't have good optimizations, didn't have amazing escape valves. But, and this is because the list of actions that the kernel supports is still pretty limited, right? So the first time when I write Ember v1 or Linux v1, I am thinking that what I'm doing is describing a declarative system. You, I give you 16 things you're allowed to do, but the 16 things is not a very big list. And probably I messed up on the escape valves too. Right? So what happens is that when you're a user who's using something like Ember or Linux v1, you find yourself using the escape valves a lot. You say, oh, I'm using Linux, but I have to use direct mode every single day. So in the 90s, the idea of like exokernel became very popular. Like, oh, basically Linux has failed. There was a Hacker News post about this this week. Literally, Linux is a failure. It is not a fast operating system. The only way to get good performance is to basically uh, outsource it to users, to, uh, to uh, uh, processes because they can do a better job than these rinky-dink kernels that basically have no idea what's going on. And that is always, every single time, what people say about V1s. I can do a better job than this idiot kernel that basically doesn't do anything smart and is just making me go through this bloated abstraction. Every time, right? And the only question that you have to ask yourself is, is there going to be a V2? Because if there is going to be a V2, what's going to happen is you're gonna put up with some amount of pain in V1 but all your V1 program, which has the proper isolation model, so remember, if we go back, that's the point of all this. The point of all this is to provide good isolation models. V1 has a good isolation model, and V2 can be compatible. So, so for example, Ember V2 and Ruby 1.9 and all versions of Java, because they were careful in V1 to be, yes, slow, but also more declarative, more high level, more about um, describing what you're trying to do, they were able to slowly build up something that was faster and nicer and did the kind of global optimization that you would expect without breaking compatibility. Um, the goal of V2s in systems like this is to add more, to ship versions that maintain support for the set of old operations while adding support for new ones. So a good example of this is signals in Unix, right? The first version of Unix ever had signals that were process global. You could say, uh, give me a signal and you would like switch to some C stack and it would be in the same thread. There were no threads actually. And it was just crazy. If you tried to use that API, you would cry a lot. Um, but over time, more and more APIs were added that made signals more palatable. So eventually, we added signals with threads and then uh, signal information so you could find out what signal actually happened and what did it. And you could add, say, like, wait for a signal with a timeout. That's a good thing to be allowed to do. And more recently, you could say, I am waiting for some I.O., I also want to wait for a signal at the same time. And the crucial thing about signals in Unix is not that we said, ah, that number one, that's garbage. Let's throw that out. It's terrible. How did we ever do that? Let's remove it. The crucial thing is that number one on that list still works today. 
And the Space Jam website still works today, right? Because it is possible to add more support for more actions without breaking the old ones. And I think the way, place where people make mistake, a mistake here is that they assume that because idioms fundamentally change as we as a community learn more things, we are forced to break compatibility. And I saw, uh, last year I saw a lot of articles that said something like this, like the web is changing, we're getting service worker, that means we have to rewrite all our framework. But there's actually no reason for that. We can change the idioms that we use, we can make better idioms without breaking fundamental compatibility. We can keep compatibility for the old stuff while adding support for new stuff. Um, a good example of this is with in JavaScript. So with in JavaScript was added for sort of the same reason that underscore get frame was added. It's like, kind of, it's easy. We have an interpreter. We can make it work. But it was pretty much a disaster. It's almost impossible to optimize. It breaks the universe. It's terrible. Um, and what JavaScript engines basically did was they said, we're not, we can't remove it because a lot of code relies on it. We'll make it work, but we won't make it fast. And if you try to use with in today's JavaScript engines, you're basically pressing the anti-turbo button, the slow button, right? You're basically telling the engine, please don't try to do any optimizations. I'm doing a slow thing, please be slow. And that is a thing that you can do, right? So if you notice that, well, V1 made a mistake, it exposed something that we shouldn't have exposed, a lot of times you can fix, you can continue to support it in a way that is not performing. A good example of this in Ember is uh, synchronous observers. Synchronous observers in Ember we should never have supported it. We even said in V1.0 that we're probably not going to support it for that long. We ended up supporting it for that long. But we probably can't remove them. But we can make them, we can cordon them off into a space that says if you're using synchronous observers as opposed to asynchronous observers, we'll make it work, but we won't make it fast. Um, browsers have been doing this for years. I, I find it extremely ironic that people use the pace of innovation in browsers as a reason to change things all the time. Because browsers are actually a prime example of the kernel and user space pattern, right? The pattern where browsers, the first for HTML1 was very small, HTML2 was a superset, HTML3 is a superset, superset, superset. People look at it, they say, oh my god, hacks on hacks on hacks is crazy. But that's not really what's going on. In this, much the same way that you can easily decry x86 for being hacks on hacks on hacks, but it's really just a way of keeping on adding stuff without breaking existing stuff. Um, and this was really fundamentally what uh, Bill Gates really figured out in the 80s was, and, and the Intel guys figured out in the 80s was, yes, you could always build a better thing if you could throw away legacy, but throwing away legacy means that you have to reboot the universe and leave everybody behind. If you don't leave everyone behind and people can transition slowly, you end up with in a better place. So really what I'm saying is that frameworks give you longevity. Um, by describing what you want to happen rather than how to accomplish it exactly, by describing I would like this DOM node to be updated to this rather than actually manipulating it directly, we can keep swapping out the implementation under the hood, and we've done this in Ember like four times now, while leaving your app intact. Um, and if you want to build, keep working on an app for more than a year or two, and those are the kinds of apps I like to work on, you really, de you really do need to get a bit more high level in describing what it is that you're trying to do instead of inlining the exact implementation in your code all the time. Um, Ember is for apps that want to be around for a few years. Um, we fundamentally reject the idea that you have to rewrite your app every year or two just to keep up because that's not the way any of the apps that we work on as people in the Ember core team and the surrounding community actually work. Nobody on the Ember core team, nobody in the community is building apps that rewrite every year or two. So I guess what I would say is I think you should build apps that last. I think you should build apps that are going to be around for, for a while. 